<laughs> it's 2021! I have a new train whistle! That's right! Welcome to the first coding challenge of 2021. I'm very excited to do this one. I am going to program a swinging pendulum in P5.js, starting from a blank sketch. Now, this particular challenge, this concept, fits quite nicely and neatly into my Nature of Code playlist, which has way too many videos about trigonometry and oscillating motion and vectors and forces. So while you don't need to go back and watch those to follow along with this, I will be building on top of a lot of the concepts covered there. So uh, if anything is confusing or I'll try to like refer you, but you know, check the video description, there'll be links. Uh, you can ask questions in the comments, I'll help you along with this. So what do I need to do to program a swinging pendulum? Well, first I think I need this idea of a bob and then a arm, so a line. So I need an ellipse and a line. Great, so I've got the visuals down for my pendulum. Now I just need to figure out, oh, how am I gonna move it around and how am I gonna have it swing? I also was bothering me, I want the center to be a little bit darker, okay. Definitely gonna need to do some whiteboarding here. So the way that I'm going to work this out is that I am going to do this. I mean, you know, there's definitely multiple ways that you could approach this problem, and I'm also gonna do a coding challenge about springs. Um, and you could take a look at that for a way of like, you know, I could also probably have a springy pendulum, and I'll, I'll get to that when I get to that. But ultimately, what I want to do is I want to have this idea of an arm, which I'm going to represent as a line, and I can think about that as a vector, and I wanna have a bob, which is just a circle right here. And a very, very important piece of information is the angle of the arm relative to the x-axis. Why is that? The way that the pendulum should work is that I should figure out, I need to calculate, right, the ideas of it swings, it's swinging along a circular path. The arm, I'm talking about an idealized pendulum with an infinitely rigid arm that can never ever be stretched or contracted or broken. So um, this distance, this arm length, is always the same, no matter, not drawn particularly well, wherever the pendulum might be. So the way that I go figure out how to draw the pendulum is all based on a particular angle, and this is the important angle right here, theta. So let me actually first add that to the code. Like what if I happen, and I'm gonna use radians, if you're unfamiliar with radians, those Nature of Code play videos that I referred to at the beginning, we'll cover that. But let's just imagine first that I have the radians, uh, radians of pi divided by four is this particular angle. Uh, actually, it's rel relative, I said relative to here, but I'm actually looking at relative to this y-axis, to the center. So I'm gonna look at that particular angle and see if I can uh, just change my drawing to have it start in the right place. So I'm gonna make a variable called angle, and I'm gonna say in setup, angle equals pi divided by four. Now, eventually I might wanna do this in a sort of thoughtful, object-oriented way, but I'm just going to have a variable called bob, and bob is going to be a vector, and then I also need an arm length, which I'll just use the variable len, and I'll say that is 100. So I feel like I need to draw this again now with those three variables in mind. This is the arm length 100. This is the angle pi divided by four. I'm just gonna write 45 degrees as that equivalent angle in, in uh, degrees. I need to figure out where is that point. So I need to figure out what is the y offset from here, and the x offset from here. Well, guess what? <laughs> Trigonometry is the answer to my prayers here. Um, if I know this angle and I know this value, well, sine, right, if this angle again is theta, sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, x divided by 100, cosine of theta equals y, uh, adjacent over hypotenuse, y divided by 100. Multiply each side of the equation by 100, and x equals 100 times sine, y equals 100 times cosine. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's a little bit backwards. Isn't x usually associated with cosine and y associated with sine? Yes, if you look at my polar coordinates video, it's absolutely true, but I've kind of drawn things on their side here because I'm looking at this particular angle uh, relative to the vertical axis rather than the horizontal axis. I'm gonna create a new variable for the origin point, like where the arm is attached. And we'll say origin equals create vector 300 comma zero. Like it's attached there at the top. And so now the line should be from origin.x, 
origin.y to bob.x, bob.y, and then the bob is at bob.x and bob.y. The problem is I now need to calculate the bob position. Well, that's what I just worked out. Bob.x equals the length times sine of the angle. Bob.y equals the length times cosine of the angle. Hmm, that doesn't look right. <laughs> so why is that wrong? The reason why that is wrong is these values are relative an y offset and an x offset from that origin point itself. I just added those things to the origin point of 0, 0. So what I need to do here is say add origin.x and add origin.y. There we go. Now I can make, I probably want to make the pendulum a little bit longer. Let's make it 300. We can see, and there we go. All right, so this is good. If I have a particular angle value, then I'm visualizing the pendulum correctly, whatever that angle might be. For example, if I were to just say now angle plus equals 0 0.01, the pendulum is not swinging in a realistic fashion, uh, but it is swinging around. You can see that angle is changing. So I just need to figure out how does that angle change realistically, assuming that there is a force of gravity pulling it down. Now, noticing here, to get it to move, I'm changing the angle by some constant value. That can also be thought of as an angular velocity. Once again, a topic that I, angular motion is a topic that I cover more extensively in the Nature of Code videos. But for right now, I'm just going to add two additional variables. I'm going to say angle V for angular velocity, and then angle A for angular acceleration. Acceleration is a concept that's tied to force. Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. I'm ignoring mass here. The, obviously, mass is very important, the fact that that bob has a mass to it. Um, but I'm going to kind of just assume its mass is 1 as of now. Um, but so I could simplify Newton's law and just say force equals acceleration. So the idea is the gravity force will somehow go into the acceleration, which will then alter the velocity. So the math here would be the velocity changes the angle, and the acceleration changes the velocity. So if I were to just add a little acceleration value here, we would see it's going to start, <laughs> it's as if I'm swinging it around and around and around and around. But I need that acceleration to be related to the force of gravity itself. So back to the whiteboard, let's figure that out. The force of gravity can be represented as a vector pointing down, at least in the world that I'm deciding to visualize. It's a flat world where gravity points down. I can think of the force of gravity just as a constant. Uh, I'll make up an arbitrary number. Obviously, in the real world, there are actual units of measurement that are quite fundamental to the laws of physics. But you know, for right now, um, this is going to be some arbitrary constant. I thought they're going to be really strong, really weak to, um, in the um, in the actual simulation that we eventually create, you know, but maybe for now it's going to be one. Why doesn't the bob just fall to the ground? Well, it doesn't because it's attached. It's attached to this arm. So there is a force, a tension force of the arm that is keeping it from just falling down. And there's so much more <laughs> to how this might work in terms of tension and maybe torque and all sorts of other factors that we could bring into this. Ultimately, the way we can work this out is to make a nice right triangle right here out of this particular force of gravity where the right angle is relative to the axis defined by the arm of the pendulum. So in other words, you know, I have before I was making this right triangle up here to figure out where to position the bob. Now I'm making another right triangle to take this force of gravity and separate it into two components. What are those components? There's this component here, which we can think of as the equivalent force holding it, uh, locking it in place, uh, not in place, but um, to its sort of swinging path, the arm itself. And then this right here is the angular acceleration, the sort of component of the force of gravity that is applied to the swinging of the pendulum itself. And guess what? Look at the way that I've drawn this. 
right over there. This angle theta is exactly the same angle as this. So this right here is what's known as the pendulum force. Force of gravity, this component of this right triangle is the force of the pendulum. And let's go back to our trigonometry formulas. Sine of theta equals opposite, the force of the pendulum, divided by hypotenuse, the force of gravity, and therefore, force of the pendulum equals sine of theta times the force of gravity, which I have, just by the way, mentioned is just a uh, constant, what number that I can make up. Let's see what happens if I take this exact formula and apply it in code. The force of the pendulum equals, and I'm going to make gravity a constant, gravity times sine of the angle. Then I'm just going to say angle of the angular acceleration equals that force. Now look at this. Whoa, it's kind of going crazy. Why is it going crazy? We have to remember this is not anything close to resembling the real world. This is a canvas in JavaScript in the browser. Uh, that's everything is a flat world measured in pixels. So while the and the force of gravity, the value one is a really really large number to ultimately start applying to an angular acceleration. So let's go back and play with that number and make it much much smaller. Oh, look, it's kind of working, but what's going on? <laughs> it's flying in the opposite direction. Whoa, this is going kind of crazy. This always happens, right? Because the, in, the, in, in the sort of typical mathematical diagramming of things, we have a Cartesian plane. The y-axis points upward, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But in a computer graphics P5 canvas, 0, 0 being in the top left, y points down. So I think I've got things flipped. Sorry, 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 I have to interrupt. Uh, this is Dan, you recognize me uh, because I'm the person in the video you're watching. <laughs> but I'm, I'm coming to you to issue a correction. I was, after recording this video, I've been looking around at some of the past material related to chapter three and I found some comments on the internet. And I found out uh, that I've been kind of making a mistake in the way that I've been describing the pendulum. And I wanna issue that correction here in this video. What I was just discussing is why I need to add a negative one. Why do I need to multiply this formula that I derived? The force of the pendulum equals the force of gravity times sine of theta. Why do I need to make this negative one or negative one times this? And I was kind of just going with my usual shtick about how, well, it must be because y points down in P5 and y really points up in a Cartesian plane, but that's actually not really the case here. The point of confusion is much more about the way that I'm looking at this angle relative to the y-axis. So let's look at this. Usually, like if you go back to my polar to Cartesian video about those uh, polar coordinates, um, you'll see that, yeah, I talk about an angle and it's relative to the x-axis, and that's much more typical. But here, because the angle is relative to the y-axis, as, as the pendulum extends outward, the force of the pendulum is negative sine of that angle. So that's really why it just has to do with precisely the way that I'm drawing this diagram right here with the angle relative to the y-axis. And while the force of gravity is pointing down, um, causing it to accelerate back in this direction, which is causing it to spin quite out of control. So I think an easy uh, fix to this is to just um, add a negative one. And we can see now it's swinging back and forth. Now, uh-oh, oh my god, it's swinging faster and faster and faster. That doesn't seem right. Sorry, hi, um, you're not gonna believe this. <laughs> Here I am again, a the same Dan, different time, actually almost a full week later. I've been working on this pendulum video, it's been such a journey, but I figured out with the help of the Coding Train members in the Discord, a couple things about this pendulum simulation that I never actually understood before right now. And I'm really excited to share those things with you and sort of just finish off the last few minutes of this video with some new found knowledge. First, this spinning out of control, why is it doing that? Well, this happens in a lot of physics simulations where a system can be very unstable. And there's various reasons for that. I talk about Euler integration as one of the reasons. But actually, I have a very subtle but unbelievably significant error here in the order that I wrote this. I am calculating the angular acceleration based on the angle. Then I change the angle, and then I change the velocity based on that angular acceleration. There's an issue, there's a three-step process here. 
calculate the force, update the velocity according to the force, update the position according to the velocity. And I have done that out of order here. All I need to do is do this in the proper order where as soon as I calculate that angular acceleration based on the current angle, then I apply that to the velocity and that velocity is what applied to the angle. I don't change the angle based on the velocity from the previous time before the other position. It's all out of whack. So now if I run this again, we'll see that this pendulum, there are definitely inaccuracies to this due to the large time step of my P5 simulation, but it is a much more stable pendulum here. There's another aspect to this that has been a breakthrough in my mind that just, just literally happened in the last 10 minutes, um, which has really bothered me for a long time in the way that I position this example, the pendulum example, in the Nature of Code book itself. Uh, after all, I spent two entire chapters talking about vectors and forces as vectors and moving mover objects around a canvas in a two-dimensional space according to their xy position and the xy vector of their velocity and acceleration. And then all of a sudden, I say, ah, never mind about that. Let's just work on one angle, angular acceleration. Well, in the case of a simple pendulum, right, this idea of this sort of idealized pendulum that has no friction and like the rod is like massless and there's just this bob. It kind of is a nice case study in working with angles. So I think that's why it makes sense. But I kind of never really understood something about it, which I want to get into right now. So what is that thing? So there's a big missing piece here and I think that I could demonstrate it to you briefly for a second. Let's take a look. I'm going to give myself more vertical space to work with. Let me put on auto refresh. And then I'm gonna try just playing around with this arm length variable. Let's make it uh, 600. All right, that seems kind of weird, right? That doesn't really feel right. Well, let's make it 60. Oh, that's kind of right. What's going on here? Why does that not feel right when it's longer, but it feels more right when it's shorter? If it's in between, eh, what's going on? If you look at the derivation of how the angular acceleration of a simple pendulum is calculated, I will refer you to two wonderful websites um, that I'll also put up on the screen right now that have more detailed explanations of what I'm gonna give you right now. You'll see the angular acceleration, which I could sort of say like theta acceleration, is equal to the gravitational force times sine of the angle divided by r r being this arm length. Why is that? After all, the force of the pendulum is equal to the force of gravity times sine of theta. I worked that out just previously, like in the video you were just watching just now. So why does that change? That force of the pendulum is the same. Well, that force of the pendulum is the same. And if I were looking at linear acceleration in terms of the Cartesian space, it would accelerate and therefore move the same distance. But guess what? Let's say this is the arc path of the pendulum here with this arm length. Now let's say I have a much longer arm length. This is the arc path. Well, if it moves this amount of distance here, that references this change in the angle. But let's say I move that same amount of distance down here. Notice that I need a much smaller angle to get that far. So the longer the arm length, the less the angle needs to change to travel a certain distance. When the arm length is shorter, the angle needs to change more to travel that same distance. So the angular acceleration is larger, shorter arm, smaller, longer arm. Divide by, the ang the, divide by that arm length. <laughs> okay, I think I finally understand this now. Hopefully I explained this in a way that was helpful to you. I, I admit that maybe I didn't. Um, hopefully some of the resources that I'll put in the video's description will be better explanations. It took me a long time to sort of sort this out. I can come back and follow up on it more in a live stream or some other videos. But let's just take a look. Let's add that now to the code. So the next piece that I need to add is to divide by r, or in this case my variable is called length. So if I look at that angular acceleration calculation, divide by length. Now it's moving incredibly slowly, of course, because now that I'm dividing by length, I need a larger force to begin with to make it sort of feel more natural. So let's go back and just change this to like one. That looks pretty good. So let's see now if I make the arm shorter versus longer versus medium. Does it feel right? I'll just sort of do this quickly and you let me know. Well, you won't be able to let me know, but I I'm gonna watch. You let me know in the comments. Arm length, 600. Okay. Feels pretty good. Arm length, 60. Arm length, 200. I would say this feels pretty good. Oof. 
Now, because this is an idealized frictionless pendulum, it will swing forever, you know, with some other inaccuracies. So one thing you might want to consider is adding some damping to this. For example, if I were to just always, every frame, take the angular velocity and multiply it by like 0.99, reducing that velocity by 1% each frame, eventually it will swing less and less and come to a stop. Personally, I like it kind of swinging forever, so I'm going to comment that out right now. What's next for you? Well, if you're looking for a technical exercise, one thing that I would suggest is just try to turn this into an object-oriented sketch. What would it mean to write a pendulum class? In fact, that's the example that I have in the Nature of Code book, and I'll, I'll, I'll provide a solution to that in the video's description. If you're looking for a way to take this idea and make more creative visuals out of it, just making many pendulums is a great place to start. So what if you make many pendulums and vary their arm length, their period, their frequency, all sorts of properties of the pendulum? I actually did a whole half an hour, hour in a recent live stream where I tried this a few different ways. I'll link to that in the video's description so you can go watch that kind of like extended cut of this video if you want to check that out. Then, of course, there is the double pendulum, or triple pendulum, or quadruple pendulum. What does it mean to take one pendulum and then attach another pendulum to the bob of the first pendulum? This is actually quite a bit more of a complex problem than just adding two pendulums to one sketch. I did this in a previous coding challenge, which just runs through the uh, porting, the differential equations associated with a double pendulum to code in a P5GS sketch. So you could explore that if you want. And then future videos where I'm looking at other types of physics libraries, or even in the next one, the springs. What does it mean to take one spring and attach another spring to it and attach another to it? Though That will also kind of get you in that direction as well if you're interested. So try all this stuff. Please make something. <laughs> I would be so happy if you did. Uh, share it with me. Uh, you can share it in the comments, but better yet, move on over to the Coding Train website where there's a system that you can link your creative uh, version of a pendulum, simple pendulum, and share it with the Coding Train community, all right? So thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in a future Coding Train video. Goodbye.